This is Eye on Africa, France 24's program focused on the continent. I'm Charlie James, and here's what's ahead. Protesters flood Sudan's capital for a so-called million-strong march. It's a show of force as talks with the military deadlock over the transition to civilian rule. Protests turn deadly in Benin. Security forces fire automatic weapons to disperse demonstrations against last Sunday's parliamentary election. And a female-only trucking company in Ghana is bucking industry norms. We introduce you to the team of women drivers that make up Ladybird Logistics. In Sudan's capital, protesters turned out in huge numbers this Thursday. The opposition called for a million-man march as a way to keep up the pressure on the army. Negotiations between a military-led transitional council and protest leaders have been deadlocked. Our correspondent Julia Steers is covering this story in Khartoum and sent this report. Residents of Khartoum wove their way through the streets of the capital, making their presence known in the city center before arriving at the military headquarters, now the epicenter of the demonstrations. Tens of thousands streamed in in the afternoon to remind the military transitional council that they won't back down from their goal, a civilian-led government. Abu Bakr is among them. The idea is that it's a parade. When people see us, they decide to join us, and so our numbers increase and it makes us stronger. That's the whole point of starting the protest from various areas. Responding to the call of the Sudanese Professionals Association, the participants underscore the strength of the people as talks between the military and civilian leaders stall. For Abu Bakr, it's essential that citizens from across the country mobilize together. Today we're expecting at least a million so that we can deliver a clear message that nothing will hold us back until our main demand is met. Multiple groups will come together from all over. There are already lots of protesters here and by tonight we hope there will be more than a million of us. Protesters march in shifts to survive the extreme heat before night falls, a strategy to ensure a massive and continued presence. Despite fatigue, they're even more tired of the faces of the old regime. We'll stay here until this is resolved in a peaceful way and a civilian government is put in charge. This is the demand of everybody in this crowd. Keenly aware that the holy month of Ramadan begins next week, people here are intent on sorting out political negotiations quickly. As you can see behind me, protesters are still streaming in to the sit-in site here in central Khartoum. And what's very clear today is that they're sending a strong message to the Transitional Military Council that they're still able to turn out huge numbers in the streets of the capital and across the country in order to keep the pressure on the military to hand over power to a civilian-led government. Warring parties in South Sudan held talks Thursday to try and salvage a stalled peace deal. President Salva Kiir, rebel leader Rik Mashar, and a handful of other groups signed a truce back in September. Under that deal, a unity government is meant to be formed in just 10 days. But several crucial issues remain unsolved, complicating the power-sharing agreement. Meanwhile, the country's devastating conflict is in its sixth year. On Thursday, soldiers in Benin's capital fired automatic rifles to break up hundreds of protesters. According to our reporters on the ground, at least two people are dead after the clashes. The demonstrations were against last weekend's controversial parliamentary elections. No opposition candidates were allowed to participate, and turnout was historically low. Unrest is rare in this long, stable nation, but now protesters want President Patrice Talon to step down. We don't accept Talon killing our democracy like that. We don't accept it. He can't kill our democracy. If he's not afraid of a ballot, he can either resume the election or resign. It's one or the other. He should resume the elections with all the parties in the running. And we will see if the people approve of these methods. He can draw his conclusions from it. We are peaceful. 
for more on this story. We're joined now by France 24 journalist Nicolas Moulin, who is uh, from our Africa desk. Thank you so much for being here. Now, former President Thomas Boni Yayi, he led the call for this boycott of the vote, and his house has become a focal point of these protesters. But he's not the leader of this movement. So what exactly is his role? Indeed, Bonnier is not the leader of the opposition. That's Sébastien Javon, who's living in exile in France right now. But it must be said that Bonnier, who's a former president, he was president for 10 years before Talon, he's been one of the most vocal critics of the current president in recent days. For example, on Tuesday, he called for the uh, results of the Sunday's parliamentary elections to be cancelled because voter turnout was so low, just above 20 percent, and because no... Uh, opposition parties were allowed to take place, take part in that uh, election. Uh, it's interesting to say, see that these two men, Talon and Bonnier, were close allies more than a decade ago, but then Talon became more ambitious and the relationship got more acrimonious, and Bonnier even accused Talon of having tried to poison him. Mm -hmm. Analysts stress how different the two men are. Uh, Talon is a billionaire who doesn't really like political rallies, whereas uh, Bonnier is a charismatic leader. Some call him a populist. Let's talk a little bit more about President Tunnel. He's been in power now for three years. What kind of leader did he start out as and how has his leadership evolved? Well, when he was elected in 2016, he hadn't been in politics for very long. Basically, he's a co cotton tycoon. And according to Forbes in 2015, he was the 15th richest man in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, he, when he was elected, he vowed to reform Benin profoundly. He likes to take big decisions swiftly, even if they're unpopular. For example, he cut down the number of days you can strike uh, during the year in Benin. Also, he reduced the number of political parties. He's been accused of wanting to control the Supreme Court. He's been accused of harassing opposition journalists. Amnesty International has denounced arbitrary arrests. Some say that his model is the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, who's a strong leader, but who's also an authoritarian one, according to his critics. What's worrying here is that for a long time, Benin was one of the most uh, democratic states in West Africa. And what we saw today is not reassuring. We saw the army opening fire on protesters. We're not used to seeing this in Benin. And we'll have to wait and see when we get the results of this election as well. Um, but it looks like protesters are not uh, planning to stop. Uh, Nicolas Germain, thank you so much for helping us understand this story. Ugandan pop star turned opposition MP Bobby Wine has been freed on bail. This after spending three nights in a maximum security prison. The politician, whose real name is Robert Chagulanyi, is, has been charged with disobeying statutory authority. The charges stem from a street protest he staged in July against attacks on social media. Wine has emerged as a leading critic of President Yuari Museveni. Via video link, Wine told a courtroom crowded with supporters that he would remain in prison if it meant standing for what is right. He is now out, but his lawyers say the conditions of his release are politically motivated. You had one of the conditions that the, the, the trial magistrate mentioned was if he engages in an unlawful demonstration, then the bail will be cancelled. Of course, the issue is who determines the unlawfulness of a demonstration. If it is this police of ours, then Bobby Wine will never be free in this country. But if the unlawfulness is determined after a due process of court, then we are comfortable. And finally on the program, in Ghana, a woman behind the wheel of a big truck turns heads. Like in much of the world, trucking there is still an industry dominated by men. But Ladybird Logistics and its team of women-only drivers now it delivers fuel to Ghana's gold mines. It claims to be the first company of its kind, and it's changing attitudes. Located in the west of Ghana, the port city of Takaradi is a hub for transportation businesses. It's here that Payan Marfa runs her women-only trucking company, Ladybird Logistics, as well as empowering women in a male-dominated sector. Employing female drivers brings other benefits to her business. I think the female drivers are more cautious. They are really careful. Um, maybe it's a female thing because we are always thinking about the children that we have at home, and making sure that you don't want to take certain risk. Every day in Ghana, hundreds of truck drivers take to the country's ramshackle roads to transport petrol to mining sites. It's a job that's traditionally been done by men. A 2014 survey found that just 0.3% of Ghanaian women were employed in the transport and storage sector, compared with 7.7% of men. 
With over 20 female drivers now working at Ladybird, the reaction from other companies and from male drivers has been positive. They're good drivers. We've not had any major incident to date. So I think now there's a lot of respect from um, the men, and they realize that these ladies are good drivers. Following in the footsteps of many of her family members, Abigail Amoa was already working as a trucker. But when she heard about a new company employing exclusively female drivers, she jumped at the chance to get involved. For her, it's not just about doing a job, it's about becoming part of a company that is trying to break down gender stereotypes in Ghana. So I feel so proud, because it helped me a lot. So I'm encouraged other women. You see, we have companies, but all female, that was the first time in, I think even, not Ghana, the whole world. So I'm encouraging other women out there to join the campaign for us to empower women to drive. It may have only recently been created, but this trucking company has big ambitions for the future. Drivers like Abigail want to set a precedent in the country that they hope will pave the way for change in other industries and sectors. Thanks so much for joining us for this edition of Eye on Africa, but don't go away. There's more news coming up next here on France 24.